So um, today we're going to talk about four common investor mistakes, and uh, they're mistakes we see not just from retail investors, but also professional investors as well as even institutions. And the one that um, I think is particularly important for today is, is uh, starting with the first one, is what we call unrealistic expectations. And one of the reasons being is that if you pull a lot of people, and this is one of the reasons we asked that question in the beginning, and said, all right, think about your long-term expectations on your portfolio. What do those returns look like? And there's been a lot of polls that have come out um, over the last few years at different sources, and one in particular, and, and why we asked you guys ahead of time, um, here's one from State Street and the Financial Times. They published over, uh, they, they surveyed over 400 institutions that manage in the trillions collectively. They said, how much do you expect, and this was U.S.-centric, but, but there's even worse cases around the world, how much do you expect bonds, equities, and, and um, your portfolio globally, globally to return? And the answers were pretty astounding, right? So if you look at bonds, I mean, most of the bond yields around the world are very low. Um, equities, double-digit returns, and oddly enough, the overall portfolio is higher than both, meaning most of these institutions think they're either adding alpha on, on top of these beta returns, or they think they have other strategies that are going to be somehow much better. Um, and we like to describe that as, when we say unrealistic expectations, we like to say that's setting the bar a little too high. And so hopefully this GIF is, is coming through okay over the internet and that it's not um, losing enough fidelity, but uh, this poor lady is trying to do the high jump um, and is, is, isn't quite making it uh, over as, as much as she thinks she would. So setting the bar too high is one of the most basic mistakes. Um, but why do people do that? And so if you look at historically, one of the reasons that people um, – one of the reasons that people uh, um, have believed that stocks are doing poorly is that, um, or sorry, one of the reasons that historically stocks have done 10% is because that's what they've returned. If you look back in the United States, going back to 1913, um, and these are real returns, looking at this chart, this is from one of my favorite investing books, Triumph of the Optimist. Um, it shows stock returns real of 6.5% per year and you add on about 3% inflation, that gets you to around that 10% number. If you look at 10-year bonds, that's a much lower number. And then, of course, T-bills in the U.S. dollar, um, the T-bill is barely keeping up with inflation. And then the 10-year bonds, if you look at for the vast majority of the period, didn't outperform uh, T-bills, um, basically keeping up with inflation only in, until we had this long bull market starting in the early 1980s did we have the chance for um, outperformance? So um, one of the reasons people are anchoring to that 10% number is that's simply what stocks have done. But from a U.S.-centric perspective, we were one of the um, biggest outperformers over the last century. So if you look at over 20 global returning stock markets since 1900, um, the U.S. was one of the best cases. The median, of course, was much lower. You had returns in the median of only around 5%. Whereas the best case, the little tiny South Africa did 7.4%. Um, and this chart doesn't actually show the worst of the worst case. It's showing around 2%. But there's other countries like Austria, which was basically zero. And then countries like China and Argentina um, and even Russia. Many of these had declines over 80 90%. In the case of China and Russia, both of their equity markets essentially went to zero. So um, one of the expectations is simply because the U.S., had such outstanding performance, but really we think that's that's unlikely to continue in the future, um, and we'll get to one of the reasons why here in a second. Um, one of the reasons also that people kind of anchor on this 10% returns is because that's simply what's been happening. They're extrapolating the past, and so a lot of investors, young millennials, but all the people that have, that have been investing over the past seven, eight years, this is one of the longest bull markets of all time, particularly in the U.S. This chart only goes back to May, but if you're looking at the Dow, in this case, um, the S&P, it's showing it's certainly one of the longest bull markets ever. And so when people have, have only seen one type of scenario where markets um, are going up, uh, they're, they're not familiar, they haven't really experienced the bear market, um, it's, it's a potential reason why they start to extrapolate returns from the past. All right, so simple question. That's what stocks have done in the past, 10% a year. Should we expect them to return what they have historically? 
Is there any reason not to? Efficient market, is this something that we should simply say, I know what stocks are going to do is because of what they've done historically? Well, the good news is we have a very simple equation that can help predict forecasts future stock returns. Um, this will be the only equation in this presentation. So uh, uh, Steve, the reason we have a picture of Stephen Hawking is that he said, his editor once famously told him, he said, for every equation you put in this book, you're going to cut the readership by half. So we want to make sure that everyone doesn't leave this presentation right now. Um, this is the only equation you're going to see, but it's actually pretty simple, and it's been around for over 20 years. And it's not my equation. It's um, an equation from one of the most famous investors in history, um, one of the men who was instrumental in launching one of the first index funds in a mutual, as a mutual fund, and that's John Bogle. So the simple formula is future 10-year returns, is what we're looking at here, can be decomposed into three simple components. One is dividend yield, so starting dividend yield. Two is earning or dividends growth. And lastly, change in valuation. Pretty simple, right? So let's look what those um, numbers have looked like historically. So historically in the U.S., we're using the U.S. as an example. We'll talk about some other countries later. That 9.6% return is due to three things. One, starting dividend yield of 4.2%. So pretty, pretty strong, a little bit higher than, than it is now, but 4.7% earnings growth. And then lastly, you've had a tiny valuation bump from U.S. stocks starting the, um, uh, the 20th century at a lower valuation and ending up at a higher valuation, actually the highest we've ever seen in December of 1999. So a very simple equation, and that gets you almost to that 10% number that investors are expecting globally. Now, what, what does that look like now? If we were to put in some numbers now, what does it look like over the next 10 years? Um, First part, starting dividend yield much lower. So 2% for the starting dividend yield in the U.S. Let's assume that earnings are being just as good as they've been historically, so 4.7%, and let's assume no valuation change. So we won't even start with that yet. That already knocks the number down to 6.7%. Remember, what are people expecting? 10%, okay? And then in the second equation on this chart is going to show you that if you wanted to break out earnings yield or dividend yield, into two components, you can break it out into um, real earnings yield and inflation. And the reason I bring this up is that, particularly in the U.S., but also globally, um, a lot of companies have changed the way they distribute their cash flows. So a lot of companies are paying out more in buybacks than they are in dividends. So this artificially makes the dividend yield look a little bit lower, but it, what it has the effect of doing is makes the dividend growth rate higher. So someone could look at this chart and say, you know what, I think 1.7% real dividend growth rate is a little low. Let's add a percent to do, or two to that because of buyback yield. But the problem with that is, of course, inflation is not 3% right now. So you've got to take probably a percent or two off inflation. So they probably balance out. So we still end up at this 6.7% number without looking at valuation. So let's talk about valuation. You know, we, we've uh, long been fans of 10-year price-to-earnings ratio because it's a long-term metric. This was popularized by uh, Professor Schiller in the 1990s. He called it the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio, where he adjusted for inflation over time. We like it because it's a series that you can look, back, look at all the way going back to the late 19th century. And what you can see in this chart is that it goes up and down all over the place. It hit a, five, uh, a high, like we mentioned earlier, of 45 in the late 1990s. It also got in some pretty high numbers in the third, in the uh, booming 20s, where the Cape value in the 30s. But there's also been plenty of times it's been in the low single digits, as recently in the 1980s. But again, in the 1930s, 1910s, and then it got down pretty cheap levels in 2009, sitting in a value of around 30 today. Um, and the good news is that the using long-term valuation metrics, so not just the Cape ratio, goes to show that future tenure returns fit pretty nicely with starting valuation. So if you look in this chart, these are real returns, so after inflation, but you can see that when markets are below 10, uh, future returns are the highest, and then nice stair step down, ladder all the way to where, unfortunately, the bucket we're in now, which is CAPE ratio above 25, future real returns are actually much lower. Um, so it does a pretty good job of forecasting the future. Um, so let's fathom what's possible. If you look back historically, and we're going to ignore valuation for a second, but say let's pick out the three best starting points over the last 115 years, and then let's pick the three worst. And what, how, what did stocks do, just so we know? Well, there was three times in the last 120 years 
where stocks did almost 20% a year. That's awesome. Can you imagine winning that lottery, right, and being there during those periods? Well, let's look at the characteristics of the beginning and end of those periods. Starting dividend yield for the beginning of the period, 5%. Can you imagine what a high dividend yield? And valuations were super low. Started the period at around 11. Um, well, then what you had is that the average of the three worst, negative returns. Awful, right? Dividend yield was lower starting valuations much, much higher. And then you look at where Cape ended the period, so you had in the three best periods a huge valuation boost where the Cape started at a low level and, and roughly doubled over the period, and the same thing for the three worst, where Cape started very high, ended very low. So if you look at where we are now, a dividend yield of 2%, starting Cape ratio of actually 30, is that more likely to be closer to a secular bull market start or a secular bear market? We would argue it's probably the latter. Now, everything's not black and white. Everyone who, so many people, when they want to use valuation metrics, they want to look at it and say, it's a binary sort of world. It's either um, the market's expensive and it's going to crash, or uh, the market's super cheap and you've got to buy it. And, and unfortunately, that's not the way the, the world works. What we're really looking at is a spectrum of probabilities. Uh, we like to call it probabilistic investing. And so there's a whole host of possible outcomes, and much like playing poker, or playing blackjack, you simply want to put the odds in your favor. So we built a chart here and said looking at a bunch of various different um, scenarios for the next 10 years in the U.S. This is, if you look at starting dividend yield of 2%, roughly where we are now, and then we're starting from a CAPE ratio of 30 and, and showed different variations based on valuation ending the period. So um, if you go back to, for example, uh, the, the CAPE ratio average over time is around 17. So if 10 years from now, valuation kind of declines a little bit back to where we were um, over history, you're looking at a 1.2% return per year. Not that exciting, right? But one of the nice things right now is we're in a calm inflation environment. So an inflation environment where it's like a 1% to 4% safe zone, you have the ability for investors to pay higher multiples than they would when inflation is higher than 4% or you have outright deflation. So that average allows CAPE ratio to be a little higher, up around 21, but certainly now around 30. So if, if the CAPE ratio simply declined to that level back down to um, the low 20s, you're getting positive returns, but still only about 3% per year. Again, we mentioned earlier, valuation stays flat. You're getting to roughly that 6.7% return. And for, for stock returns to equal expectations, so remember if you go back to the beginning, the survey where people were expecting 10% returns, for stock returns to hit those expectations, valuations need to go back to the highest they've ever been in the United States. So a value of 45. Okay, and say, when it, like just playing cards or just like any sort of probabilities, how likely is that? Probably not that likely. It's possible. It's happened in the past, but probably not that likely. And then to be a pessimist, if you're a perma bearer listening to this, you could say looking on the downside, what if valuations blow all the way through um, the average, what if Yellowstone erupts? That was something I saw on Zero Hedge yesterday. Uh, you know, and there's some sort of just huge catastrophe and valuations go all the way back down to 10 or five. Well, then you're looking at certainly negative returns per year um, for the next 10 years. And even in the case where you could even have up to minus 10% returns. So is minus 10 or positive 10 the most likely scenarios? No, most likely is where we're sort of the bracketed versions of that one to 4%. So not that exciting. Um, so uh, a lot of people say, well, Mav, they pull their hair out and say, you can't use CAPE ratio because of these 10 reasons, and you should, you should think about doing something else. Well, that's the thing about valuation. It's a pretty blunt tool, and it doesn't really matter which valuation metric you use. We've put some on Twitter over the last week on price-to-free cash flow. Here's one of the S&P medium price-to-sales ratio from Ned Davis, and this shows a similar sort of scenario where, in this case, the valuation is actually the highest it's ever been. Um, again, it got the turning points right. Is it cheap in the early 80s? Yes. Is it expensive in 2000, 2007? Yes. Is it cheap in 2009? Yes. So there's a lot of these sort of metrics that um, they don't all have to say the exact same thing, but in general, valuation metrics should agree. And in particularly the case of the U.S., almost all of them, actually all of them to my knowledge, um, are signaling some degree of overvaluation. All right, so depressing part out of the way. Stocks are expensive. What about bonds?